Welcome to the Sector Readiness and Workforce Capacity Business Development Module on Costing, Pricing and Budgeting. My name is Linda Hayes and I'm the Managing Director of Corporate Synergies Australia and we've been working with NDS Queensland for the past two years assisting their members, members to become ready for NDIS and changing futures in the public sector, not-for-profit and NGO environments. We're very privileged to be here today and to take you through this very important session on costing, pricing and budgeting. I will be using two key materials during this time, the slideshow that you're currently seeing on your screen as well as a workbook on costing, pricing and budgeting. I won't be going through every single slide or every single page on the workbook but I will be taking you through some critical exercises that should assist you as either board members, senior managers or finance officers in your organisation become a little bit more aware on what you should be doing around costing, pricing and budgeting your services in readiness for NDIS. This is not only a sector that has become an issue for people facing NDIS and the challenge under that. It is actually a great module for anybody working in the services industry and giving them a real opportunity or giving you a real opportunity to have a better understanding of the costs and pricing structures open to you under government tendering and also under new price competitiveness and price tendering. If you've ever been asked a question such as what is the co-contribution of your organisation to this tender, what can your organisation assist or contribute or act in volunteer hours, then this is a really important module for your business. I hope you do enjoy it and we'll be going through many exercises and I hope that you do have a good time. The first thing I'd really like to do is to take you through some of the key workshop objectives. And this is slide two of your presentation. The first thing that we're going to do is have a look at the idea of costs. What are the nature of costs? What are the common costs within our organisation? How do we classify them? How do we actually explain them? And what does that mean when we take that cost from our daily activities and actually put that into the scenario of MYOB or QuickBooks? and what our accountants and finance managers are then looking for there as well. We're going to have a look at the critical issue that we have, which is apportioning costs, our overhead costs in particular, to varying different programs that are often paid for from varying different governments from a state, local and federal level. We're going to have a look at the concept around unit costing and we will be pointing you in the direction of some fantastic workbooks and um, online exercises that you can do through NDA, NDS Queensland and also through QCOS. Um, we're going to have then have a look at the principles of pricing and really decide well, what, how does cost relate to price and what does pricing mean for us, not only under NDIS, but when we're starting to have a look at the array of services which our organisations are now forced to offer to stay competitive and to stay up to date within the market. We're going to have a look at different pricing strategies and look at what different ways that we may wish to assign prices to our services in the future. We are going to look at budgeting and forecasting and that's going to become a critical issue for some organisations who are making that transition from block funding through to uh, self-managed funding and what it is going to mean for organisations to really start budgeting and to have some money set aside to take them through that transitional period. And finally, we're going to have a look at some future challenges. And I'm going to take you through an exciting exercise, which actually looks at break-even analysis for our activities in the organisations. So the first thing I'd like you to do now is to take your workbook and your presentation and review and have a look through the pages 1 to 7 in your workbook and slides 3 to 12 on your presentation really looking at the different types of costs to give you a good understanding of the types of costs that exist within your organisation now, in particular your direct costs, your indirect costs and the shadow pricing or shadow costing which is a new concept that we will be talking about. When 
looking at costing, one of the most important things for anybody to remember is the fact that cost is not necessarily just about the money exchanging hands for the purchase or the sale of a good or a service. It is about all of the resources that we require to be able to successfully deliver that service to be from the people that we use, but also through to the time, the labour, the love, the passion, the intelligence, the intellectual property, and any other um, resource that we have on hand that not only makes us be able to deliver our service, but actually deliver that in a unique way that maintains the success, the viability, and the sustainability of our organisations. When we think about cost, we need to start thinking about more than just the money that changes hands. As a not-for-profit organisation, we do tend to fall in the habit of actually thinking that the money that changes hands is the only cost contributing to our service, and therefore that should be our price, whereas that's simply not the case. There are many, many valuable resources that we have within our organisations that we simply do not put a price or a cost on. Traditionally, we think about costs only about inputs because really that's what government funding is doing for our organisation. They are providing us the money that contributes to the input costs of our activities. If we have a look at the Productivity Commission report's conversion from inputs to outputs table that's on your screen now, you will see that not only while the inputs are very important to be able to deliver our activities, but we also have the outputs, the outcomes and the impacts. And what are the costs along the way, not just to deliver the activity, but to actually enhance that experience through the training, through the passion, through the compassion of our employees, through the fact that we really go the extra mile to find exceptional staff and that we really go the extra mile to bring volunteers so that our service can be even better and stronger. That really contributes to the outcomes of our organisations and therefore the impacts of our organisation within the community. One of the things I think we really need to start remembering is that slowly over time we are going to be more reliant from a competitive point of view on our outcomes and our impacts. If we want to have a sustainable and competitive organisation, we need to be focused not only on meeting our output requirements, but actually really thinking about what outcomes do we want our clients to have and what impacts do we want our organisation to make on the community and for the clients for which we work. If we look at a standard funding agreement between either DS or Aged Care and our organisation, they actually divide our hours or our costs themselves into what they're willing to contribute and what they're not willing to contribute to. This is a great example in regards to the area in blue and green as having hours that the government will pay for. They see that as being input costs versus those, who, those costs that they do not see as direct costs but are integral in regards to the quality and outputs of the services we deliver. So if we look at the direct cost, they say yes, time spent face-to-face -face client services in counselling, case management, personal assistance, in community care, in home care. The time spent on behalf of the client, which can be directly attributed to arranging referrals, writing the file notes from the case of that day, participating in case conferences where required, recording data at a time of assessment, mobile service delivery, so that is simply the travel to the person for the specific job, and the preparation and participation of training and in-training materials. But there's also a lot of hours that we do on a day-to-day -day basis that really add quality to our services that are not counted as service hours by government departments. In direct time, 
our team meetings where we get to share cases, we get to share information, share experiences and outcomes. Our travel, and that's travel to and from the workplace, but also to and from other learning centres and other centres that we may need to do, which do benefit the client in the long run, but it's not the direct travel to and from our client's places well, where they live. Network meetings, supervision, compiling and entering data for the longer term reporting requirements of the organisation, collation of that data, supervising other staff and making sure that they are up to date and up to speed with everything going on, and all of the other smaller administrative tasks that we tend to apply to overhead costs, we can't directly bill into that service but yet we all know are absolutely essential to the overall outcome. It is important to have a good understanding of what is expected by your government funding agencies under your own contracts. And these are some great starting points for discussion points for the exercises in your workbook on page two and page four. We are now on to slide 13 and page 9 of the workbook. If you haven't read all the pages leading up to this page, I strongly suggest that you pause me now and go back and just review because we really need to have quite a good understanding of direct and indirect costs to be able to complete this exercise successfully. This is a fabulous exercise to actually conduct it within a group and it can be done in team groups, it can be done at senior management, it can be done between the CEO and finance management, or it can even be done at a committee or board level to really get the understanding of what services your organisation does provide and what is not only the input, but the full and true cost of delivering that service to your organisation. This is a DYI costing template and it has been provided as a Word document within the module resources. So it can be downloaded and used at any time by anybody within your organisation. Most important to this, firstly, is to decide which program or activity you're going to do the costing for. And then to provide a good description of the activity so that people know whether or not it's an in-house, in-community, at client's home, where it's located, what type of service you are providing, and if there's any nuances about that service, such as you know, essentially having a special training for people, etc. After that, it then really becomes the opportunity to have a look at key inputs. And for those people who have done the exercises on page two and four of your workbooks, you can almost directly translate those lists across into that first column. Remembering that our inputs are the direct resources required to deliver this activity. Following that, we are actually then going to match that with all the direct costs. So our, whenever we're talking about direct costs, we are meaning the costs of our inputs, those that are easily recognisable. The next one across then is our overheads or our in and our indirect costs, as well as the direct face-to-face -face time that we need to have with our client in this service. What's all the other time that's not necessarily face-to-face? -face? What about the other equipment and things that we have to have to be able to deliver that but in a more indirect way. And what are the costs of those items? Finally, we look at shadow costs. Now, shadow costs are ones that we don't normally consider. They're the things that we get for free. So the discounts, the volunteer hours, the donations, the other equipment that we're given at cost price or below. If we had to pay a true commercial exchange or monetary exchange for all of those, what would be the costs associated with that? I've created an example on the next page where we've had a look at a community access and this can be for anyone from disability or aged care or a neighbourhood centre group 
or a senior citizens club, anything like that. So our community, so our program or activity today is a community access. The description is, as an organisation, we provide weekly community trips to participate in local activities or visit local attractions. Those activities may include movies, bowling, zoo trips, shopping trips and visits to the local parks. We go to various locations in and around Brisbane, but we don't tend to travel, say, for more than one hour. We use our own transport. So our key inputs here are staff. We have the direct wages that we must pay staff for that day out in the community. But then if we have a look at our overhead column, we have staff employed simply to do that, but we also have to pay them when they're doing the administrative side of this activity. Long service leave, holiday pay when they go away, or sometimes simply depending on what the contractual arrangements are. So we still have to pay for all of that, however, it's not necessarily a direct cost of that activity on that day. Similarly, we have our own car and we have our own bus. So on that day, we really just need to pay for petrol. However, over the course of an accounting period, we also have to pay for vehicle maintenance, registration, insurances, depreciation. And if we then go across to shadow costs in the far right column, we will also see that there are other costs that we don't have to pay for, but if we did, would add even more expenses to this activity. Our volunteer driver. The fact that we always receive a discount from our local mechanic to do our vehicle maintenance because we're a not-for-profit group. What are the costs if we had to pay full price for both of those services. We have entry fees and tickets as a direct cost on the day. But what we don't always include in our direct cost is the time taken to actually organise that, to contact the movie theatre, to organise group discounts, to do the booking rather than just actually be there and have that cost of the $10 ticket. We also don't always consider the discount and the free tickets we receive during the year. And again, that is a shadow price. A shadow cost in as much that we don't have to pay for it, but if we did, there would be an additional cost associated. We specialise, we get specialist medical and mobility equipment, and we often will attribute the cost or the purchase of that to our direct cost for the activity. But do we always contribute the maintenance of those products back to that, that one activity? Or do we put it in a general overhead and maintenance cost for the whole of organisation? Do we also count or record somewhere the discount that we've received or the donated equipment that we don't have to buy? And again, that's a shadow cost. Training is another one that it can appear in a lot of different columns as well. We have training. We know we might need first aid, behaviour, manual handling, a very common training that we need to put our staff through for community access type programs. But what we don't always consider are the other mandatory trainings that we also must put our clients, oh sorry, our staff in through. Our work health and safety, the fact that they need that three or higher in aged care or disability care to be able to come. And in some cases, the shadow costs there are actually the prerequisite tra training that we ask for the position in the first place. So while we may do our own training in disability care, we are also often asking for people to already have a Cert 3, Cert 4 or higher in disability care or aged care. That is not training that our organisation has paid for, but it's certainly training that our organisation gains great resources and great benefit from. By capturing all of the costs, our direct costs, our indirect costs and the shadow costs, that actually gives us the true and full cost of delivering the activity for our clients. Now, that is a great piece of information to know when it comes to having a good understanding of what it would cost for our organisation to deliver those services in a fully commercial and fully competitive market. 
In regards to how we then work out our unit costs, what we actually do is rarely include the shadow costs. So what we do is we have a look at our direct costs plus our indirect costs to give us a total cost of delivering the service. And then we can break that down into either hourly units or per person costs depending on what the activity is. So for my community access, I would put that down as a cost per person, cost per client for that person to come along and spend a day with our organisation out in the community. Now, when we take that into consideration in regards to direct costs, we realise, you know, things aren't necessarily as simple as this DIY costing exercise. So what I would encourage everybody to do now is to have a look at slides page 14 to 19 and pages 8 and 9 in your workbook to have a look at some of the issues surrounding apportioning costs, our indirect cost that is, across the multiple activities and services that we provide as organisations. As part of your reading, you may wish to have a look at the benchmarking unit costs on page 10 and page 11 of your workbook. What's particularly interesting in this scenario is that they've had a look at the cost of delivering domestic assistance and personal care in 2009 across all of the states and territories in Australia. And if we have a look, for example, at domestic assistance, we can see that New South Wales and WA have the highest costs at nearly $50 per hour, to, and that is including all direct, indirect and shadow prices, whereas the lowest actually exists in Victoria where the costs have come in at just over $20 an hour. Queensland has by far the highest costs of personal care. And it's quite interesting to see that the ACT also has a very high cost of personal care. Because in some circumstances, such as New South Wales and WA, we may actually consider that it's due to distance needs to be travelled because they're bigger states, as is Queensland. But it doesn't necessarily um, proportionately act in that way across the difference between domestic assistance and personal care. Wages is one of the big drivers in the cost factor for this chart and there are different standards and different requirements of wages and salaries for people with domestic care, care and domestic assistance versus personal care qualifications. The different state requirements on qualifications have now really come under a federal work, health and safety and federal act but there are still significant wage differences and those wage differences simply occur because of the differing demand for people with those skills in those states. If we then actually go over to page 11, we can see which parts of the areas have some of the highest unit costs. In particular, Allied Health with the highest unit cost of 82.48 per hour. We also have a very high cost in nursing care of 78.47 per hour. If we look at some of the lowest costs, and we go down to number 11, meals, the lowest unit cost, $5.01. And I work for a lot of meals on wheels, so I say that's where you come in. The highest being $13.65. If we have a look at social support, some of the lowest unit costs are $2.95. Now those services are ones that have incredibly high participants of volunteers. So when they add up all of their costs, because they haven't included the shadow costs of the volunteer hours, only the direct and overhead costs, they're really just counting the salaries and wages of the one support worker or the one coordinator within their organisation. If in this case shadow costs had have been included, it would be very interesting to note whether or not that's any changes in the lowest to the highest unit cost. Going back to apportioning our indirect costs, slide 20 shows a range of methods 
and slide 21 gives us an exercise across those methods in apportioning a simple or a di um, indirect cost such as rent. Some of the most common ways of apportioning costs or the cost of rent is the floor space occupied for each one of the activities or services or programs within an organisation, the annual revenues generated by those programs, the number of staff or staff hours within those programs, and also the number of client service hours that is delivered within those programs. This is particularly complicated for those organisations that may have multiple funding structures, multiple funding incomes from a range of different sources. There's no one standard methoding of apportioning um, costs such as these. The most important thing that any one organisation can remember is the fact that you need to come up with a methodology and apply that methodology across all programs so that we are comparing apples with apples. If we now turn over the slides to page 21, there is actually an exercise here in apportioning indirect costs. It is, I've done this exercise with so many different organisations over the last couple of years and the thing is, is that it really comes up differently for each one of the organisations and it is dependent on how complex the organisation is, how many programs you offer, how many staff you have, and often whether or not you've got just one funding arrangement, say one DS package, or multiple packages from a range of different state and federal organisations. The example here, we've got a monthly office rent of $5,000, and we want to start apportioning that across the different programs that the organisation has, because we want to start understanding the true cost of each of the programs. We've been given the number of staff, we've been given floor space, and we've been given annual revenues. And as you can see, Program 2 really takes up the majority in regards to um, percentage of floor space and also annual revenue. The decision is one of your own as to which way you would want to take it. In this case, we would suggest that we would be basing it on annual revenues, mainly because the income, the rent would then be appropriate and apportioned to the income generated by those programs. But it would still be a very interesting topic for you to bring up within your organisation to see who would agree on what. And most importantly, having those discussions between program managers finance, the CEO and your committee and board. Now we're going to move on to start having a look at price and what determines and influence prices. Again, we're looking at section 4 within your workbook that starts on page 14 and we're looking at the section of slides from slide 20 through to, sorry, <laughs> through to 25. I mentioned earlier that we have, as a not-for-profit and NGOs, we have fallen into the habit somewhat of thinking that what something costs must be equal to what our price is. We think of ourselves as not-profit-making organisations and therefore we don't necessarily always allow ourselves to generate some extra income that can be put aside for surpluses. Now, one of the recent more um, you know, funny things that have come out there is surplus equals smiles or smiles for surpluses. And it is becoming a really important thing for our organisations to have in regards to our own viability and sustainability. We need to have some surpluses in place that safeguard our organisation and the operations and service delivery of our organisations for at least three months and ideally for six to nine months. If anybody is interested in having a look at how to calculate that and wanting the formulas to find out whether or not their organisation is currently financially sustainable, please contact me directly via uh, either our website or info.csa at bigpoints.com. 
So if we're looking at price, we need, as we said, we're now separating that from cost. And once we have an understanding that cost is what we pay out, we can now start thinking about is price as what our income could be. We have significant influences on the decisions surrounding our ability to influence price. We have the agreements from the government saying what they will actually accept to pay us for a particular hour of service delivery or unit of service delivery. We have other competitors within the marketplace as well. Um, and while that's not so much so now for um, disability service-based organisations, it will certainly be that way in the future. And for anyone who is in childcare or aged care, you will already be recognising just how important price can be as a determinant for your service. We are also um, starting to be asked for the best price, best value. What co-contribution can we offer? So what we need to really be recognising, if we know our full and true costs and we make a decision to cut our price, at least that is a transparent and knowing decision and we can counter back with that difference to our government structures as our co-contribution back into the program. We're not really sure yet what exactly is going to happen under pricing under NDIS and as I'm sitting here recording on the 6th of November 2013, the last announcement in regards to pricing occurred on the 1st of November 2013, so last Friday afternoon, suggesting that the pricing structures and modelling were still under serious negotiation and research and development by the Federal Government. And I think that that overall, and I think we can all believe overall, that that is quite a smart move. In saying that, what we do know is that there are going to be certain prices that will be set. And if people think about it like a Medicare model, that's pretty much what NDIS has been set up to look like. So we all have the opportunity to offer a price for a service. And what we will need to make a decision for is what costs are we willing to take into that service delivery. So for example, one service, one organisation may offer a, an hour of in-home care, have that structurally broken down into 15 minutes of admin and support, 10 minutes of transportation to and from and 35 minutes of actual face-to-face -face time with the client within their home. And that will be not only the cost but the pricing structure that they agreed to under the given price of let's say $35 from NDIS. Yet another organisation may structure that quite differently, offering 45 minutes of face-to-face -face time but not a lot of admin time, but they will provide a quarterly report rather than a monthly report. What this means for organisations is that difference from contractual agreements that we currently will have with individuals, or sorry, that we currently have with the government will actually change quite significantly when we start working one-on-one -on -one with individuals. And we will have the flexibility as organisations to actually change those contracts to the individual needs and wants of our clients. What we may come up with is a flat base pay. So yes, for the $35 that NDIS can be claimed directly back, this is exactly what we offer for one hour of service time. Or we may also then like to think about having premium pricing strategy where our clients can pay the difference of 10 or 15 dollars but have a much more face to longer time face to face with our 
support workers. So if we consider some of the pricing strategies that we actually have available to us now, they're quite significant. Just as we will now have the clients will have the opportunity to choose who they go to, we will also have the opportunity to select a range of different pricing strategies for our services that we've been delivering. Some of our services, and let's call those our baseline services, may be absolutely directly matching the funding agency contribution pricing. And that's whether or not that is a traditional contract like we currently have with DS, or whether or not that is a new contractual position or a new pricing strategy under NDIS. Other options that we have is to allocate our costs, have a true understanding of the cost of service delivery, and then we mark up a small amount that will cover our overheads and admin pricing. Some organisations, particularly that within the aged care sector, but also some who have already, some DS services that have already moved on to um, managing self-directed funding packages are using this model. So they're using the cost or direct cost of the service delivery plus a small mark on top of that or margin on top of that to cover overheads for the organisation as a whole and the setting up and management of the contracts and the program for those individual families. We then have marginal cost pricing strategy, which means that all we will do, doesn't matter what service we deliver, but we are going to do everything will be 100% cost plus 10%. Now that can work for some organisations where their range of services is pretty flat. However, we tend to deal with a, quite a range of what I would call vertically, um, vertically aligned services where different complexities, different needs and different requirements come in at every single stage. We are more and more seeing the idea of competitive and tender pricing as well. More and more times we are actually seeing within um, the tender saying how are you co-contributing, best value, offering the best price, what, um, what value can you offer on above and beyond this contract. And all of those are setting us up for the reality of competitive tendering in the future. Now, competitive tendering is not, and certainly price-based tendering, is not always about the resource of cost, again, is what we're going to charge, but what is the total value of money so long as it fits, or the total value of resources we're offering for the program, so long as it fits within the scope of that program. One thing that we have seen in the past in other sectors and will soon start to see is predatory or penetration pricing. Now penetration pricing is used by larger, usually larger organisations that have a range of additional resources that can afford to undercut the market price or the cost for a period of time to actually eliminate some of their competitors out of the market. And it's very aggressive because it, it really is their, out, their goal is to eliminate as many competitors, competitors as possible within that market area. It's not yet been seen within disability services, but it certainly has been seen in regards to large organisations in childcare services and aged care services, particularly when the sector starts opening up to private organisations. So we do need to remember that with the under NDIS, it may be a circumstance that some of our clients do decide to go over for a certain amount of their service delivery to other organisations. And that will be a swings and roundabout that happens as people check out their range of choices that are open to them. The most interesting thing with predatory pricing is that it only ever works for part of the market for part of the time. All of us, if we think in our real lives, have an idea as 
of how low or how limited a quality of service that we're willing to put up with. And we may do it for a short period of time to get to an area that we want, but over a longer period of time, we do tend to swing back to the comfort zone and to buying the quality that we know and trust. We see that happening quite a lot when new supermarkets open up in areas. At first, they are absolutely undercutting all of the other butchers and bakers and, and fruit shops in the area. But over a period of time, in most cases, that equilibrium will balance back out as the customer themselves says, I want the premium beef and I want the premium bread and return to actually um, buy at their delicatessens, etc. We have market pricing, and market pricing is really the most fairest of pricing. It considers not only what other people are charging, but it comes up with a fairly flat rate approach to not only what to charge, but also what's acceptable by their range of clients. One of the um, best examples, I believe, of market pricing is when you go and have a look at um, your fruit and vegetable stores if you have access to large fruit and veg and fresh markets. Um, their pricing will alter on product as seasons change, as availability changes, demand changes, and as supply changes as well. And that's what really market pricing is about. And the final pricing strategy that we have, which is quite important to to really consider is premium pricing. As we tend to fall into the habit in regards to cost of believing what we things cost is what we should charge, we also tend to fall into the habit of not necessarily offering a higher quality of service to some people, some clients within our community who may actually not only be able to afford it, but may actually be wanting it. A really good example of this more recently is perhaps um, some of the variations that Meals on Wheels organisations across Australia are making in regards to their menus. Not only are they staying with the traditional and lower priced menu options, but as they are moving away from just servicing aged care people under hack within their communities, they're also looking at gaining um, footholds into people who have short-term mobility issues or short-term need. They also are providing a range of menu choices available for them and increasing the price margin on those particular um, meals to gain those additional incomes and surpluses. Now, as a not-for-profit organisation, of course, all the surpluses gained are actually then put back into the community to help them keep the meals lower for those who truly can't afford it. And it is a great strategy that is really working within some communities and providing a great range and great options. Funnily enough, one of the outcomes of that has not only been having new people come in to enjoy the service over a short-term basis, say after a knee or a hip operation, but some of their older traditional clients are actually choosing from the gourmet menus once or twice a week or once or twice a fortnight as their own little treat. Each one of these pricing strategies are further explained on page, um, well, through page 16 within your workbook. And it's always good to go back and just have a second look at any of those definitions. We can now start having a look at the concept around budgeting and forecasting and the changes that we need to make under NDIS. I'm sure that many of the organisations that are tuning in today have already do or do already do an operational budget. And that budget is probably looking at um, expenses income and income on a quarterly basis, reporting that back up to committees and hopefully doing what you'd forecasted against the actuals at the end of each quarter. A really good um, example of this is on slide 31, as we've just clicked through, where we had a look at the different income streams, our different expense streams, and what is happening from a budget point of view, quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. Now, 
don't forget that we need to report back to ensure that we are monitoring these. So at the end of quarter one, we really should insert a table which says quarter one forecast or quarter one budget and then quarter one actual so that we can monitor the relationship between the two. Under NDIS, we will be moving from a situation where we've received block funding in advance for the services we're going to supply to putting and invoicing individual clients or individual packages and programs at the end or during the services. So there is going to be somewhat of a delayed gap at some stage, not all clients at once, but over a period of time there will be some gaps as we do this transition from money up front, if we like, to money in arrears or after the service has been provided. So more and more it's becoming very, very important not only to have a good understanding of your operating, uh, operational budget, but also to incorporate our cash flow within that. Because a lot of the decisions we'll be needing to make about our expenditure will actually be based on what's in the bank at the beginning of the quarter to what we're predicting will be in the bank at the end of the quarter and making sure that we're not overspending at any time that puts us in our own arrears. Any, of, any time that we are constantly putting ourselves and spending more a quarter than we're making is actually going to challenge in the longer term our solvency. So we really need to start making account for what is our cash in hand at the beginning and at the end of the period. For that, we are really recommending that organisations start moving away from a standard operating budget and really start focusing on the development of a cash flow budget. In all honesty, there is relatively small difference. As you can see, at the top row here, we actually do start with our opening and balance for the year or for the quarter, the quarter one of course being here. We also include our capital inflows, so anything about bank overdrafts, reductions, capital income, which is also can be anything on interest earned, etc. We also include our capital outgoings, so our repayments on office equipment, which is here. Replacement of the photocopier that we need to do in quarter two. Upgrading of IT systems that we've budgeted out for over the year. And what it shows us is not only our starting amount in the bank, but then with all of that plus our usual expenses, what we should have in the bank at the end of the accounting period as well. Overall, we will see that we're going to start the year with 62,000 cash in the bank and we're going to end the year with 75,000 cash in the bank. So it gives us a true position of where we're starting and where we're going to rather than just having our income and expenses given to us each month because what is true about incoming expenses is that it's been and done. Now moving on to cost versus price and what this can mean for us is one very, very good option. What, if we know what our total revenue and our total expenses are, what we can actually have an understanding of is what our margin for safety or the sensitivity of our organisation is. In this example, we have an organisation whose total revenue for the year was 370000 and their total expenses was 350000 which gives and left them an annual surplus of $19,600. What this table actually shows us is how close 
to the operational red they really are. If by chance the organisation simply did not meet the revenue, its forecasted revenue by 5%, so the revenue decreased to 95%, automatically without any changes in the expenses, surplus for the year would go down to just $1,000. And if they did that in combination with an increase of expenses of just 5%, you can see that the organisation would be very quickly in the red of the tune of $16,000. Yet, going the other way, all they need is an increase of revenue of just 5% through independent means, donations or fundraising income. And all of a sudden, on the same expenses, the surplus goes up to 38000 what this gives us is a really good idea of what we need to do to achieve those additional revenue and what additional revenue and savings in expenses could really mean for our organisation. If we have a look at exactly the same organisation but two years later, they started working on getting a range of revenues, not just from the direct block funding, but from other user pay services, so their revenue actually increased to 476000 while their expenses did not really change that much. So they utilised all of their existing resources in a more efficient and effective way and to a full 100%. Automatically, we can see what that did to their overall surplus for the year. Putting themselves in a much stronger place from a viability as well as a sustainability point of view. Now, this particular spreadsheet has not been provided within the example module materials. However, again, if anybody would like one, please contact me and we can send through this as a formulated spreadsheet where all you need to do is put in your projected revenue and your projected expenses, not only for your organisation but for individual activities. So this sensitivity analysis can also not only give you an idea of the sustainability of your whole organisation, to give you a really good and true understanding on those activities that you or services that you provide and whether or not they individually are viable and sustainable. And finally today, I would like to talk to you about the opportunity to work out break-even analysis. Now this is using some similar data that you've seen on the spreadsheets throughout this PowerPoint presentation. And the full explanation of, the, of it is also provided within your workbook. Section 7.2 on pages 23 and 24. What break-even analysis also allows us to do is to have a good understanding of the hours, example labour hours, that we would need to put into a particular service for it to break even. And what is most critical that we understand when trying to do a break even analysis is what our fixed costs are and what our variable costs are. So if we look at the same organisation, the income is the same, 2015, at 476000 and $50. So that gives us that income line. And we assume that the income is a, is a ongoing and consistent variable. So as our hours go up, so does our income. We then have two sets of costs. We have our fixed costs which is whether or not we open the doors and whether or not we deliver one hour of service, we still need to pay our fixed costs. Rent, telephones, 
all of those types of things. We also then have, so our fixed cost that we've calculated here for our organisation is 196300 So we draw a straight line at that point. We also then have our variable costs. Now our variable costs increase or our additional costs as our hours of service delivery go up and they're often attributed back to wages client support services, consumables, motor vehicle costs, and in this case, salaries and wages, as you can see in this area here. So to put in and work out our variable cost then, we then started our fixed cost, and we draw a line up to our total cost of 375306 which matches our total cost budget, 375. So if we have a look, again, we have our, and we look at it on the uh, y-axis, we have our fixed cost going up to 196300, plus our variable cost of 179, giving us the total cost of 375306. Now, our break-even point for the organisation is where the income and total cost line intersect. So in this case, we need to deliver approximately 9,000. Let me see if this will work. Thank you for bearing with me, everybody. So if we draw a line straight down, just shy of 10,000 hours, and an, inc an income just under or of approximately 300. And if you actually look at page 24 within your workbook, it takes you through each one of those steps. What break-even analysis gives us the opportunity to do is to look at and understand the point at which we're losing money, which is all this area in here, against the point in which we are making money, which is all of the area in here. Now that is quite a quick way to have a look at this particular diagram. But what is most important is that it's quite a good visual representation in what we need to be doing as an organisation. And for any organisation that does have a finance officer or a finance manager attached, they can create break-even analysis fairly easily. Funnily enough, I'm not an accountant, and even I can understand this one. The most important thing is to have a good understanding of all of the hours, knowing that the average hours worked by a full-time person, 38 hours a week, is 1,500 hours per year, and knowing what your budgeted income is. Now, in this example, at 15,000 hours, that means that we have 10 employees, all working 1,500, or 10 equivalent full-time employees, all working 1,500 hours per year. I do hope that the record recorded information, the slides and the workbook have given you a stronger understanding of the importance and requirements of costing, pricing and budgeting under NDIS and I really do appreciate the time that we've spent together. If you have any further information whatsoever, please contact me at Corporate Synergies Australia, info.csa at bigpond.com or visit our website www.corpsynergies.com.au for our full contact details. Thank you.